uh, Bennett introduce himself and, and others. Yeah. To get started. Yeah, thanks, Len. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for, for joining here. I think uh, I see quite a few folks have joined us, so I, that's, that's great to see. Um, myself, my name is Bennett Howard. To introduce myself, I, I'm with Sodic. Uh, I'm a sales team here uh, for injection molding machinery. Um, actually, right now, I'm out in Michigan. Um, I cover that area, Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin, as well as uh, the Southwest United States for us. So um, that's why I'm in this Starbucks here, if you can see my background. But again, thanks everybody for joining. We've got Len Hampton uh, as well. Uh, he's our national sales manager uh, for Sodic Injection Molding Machinery. I know a lot of you know Len, um, I think 20, 30 years in the industry. So. Len, thanks for kind of sponsoring this uh, this webinar series. Been, been great so far. Um, and then we, from, you know, from our side, Weston Harbaugh, uh, my counterpart uh, in sales for injection molding machinery for Sodic as well. He covers uh, the East Coast and another portion of the Midwest uh, as well for us. So um, Weston will be kind of in a moment here walking us through how we'll we'll handle question and answer and and. Uh, He's very, you know, responsible for, for setting a lot of this up. So thanks, Wesley. Uh, and then we've got uh, Barb. I I, uh, I know we're actually meeting for the first time today, but Barb, thanks for joining us. And then uh, Dr. Ron Lamonte from uh, from Polyplastics. Um, you may know the, the Topaz material. So uh, if you kind of heard us before, um, you know, this is a, a unique material. We've worked with it and, and these folks uh, in the past with in kind of in the microfluidic arena, but it, it, it can be, you know, has some really unique properties in terms of optical and medical applications and, and things like that. So I know a lot of folks are, are very interested, but uh, the speaker today uh, will be Dr. Lamonte. He's the technical marketing specialist uh, in the medical diagnostic processing and optical application uh, areas for, for uh, polyplastics. He's got a PhD in chemical engineering and looks like over 45 years of experience uh, in the industry, um, you know, with, with difficult materials and, and, uh, and injection molding applications. So really, really excited to have these folks on. Um, thank you for, for joining us. Weston, I'll, I'll kick it over to you here real quick to, uh, to kind of go through the logistics of the question and answer, and then we'll get, we'll get started. Thanks everybody for joining. All right. Thanks Bennett. Um, and welcome, Dr. Lamonte, and, and to our audience out there, um, welcome to Sodic and Friends number 28. Uh, thanks, everybody here, for joining us and making the webinar series a great success here. Been running it about 18 months, and it's it's been doing real well. So um, we have a great presentation today, as well as a great lineup coming up. Um, we'll see some more LSR presentations with Elmet and MR Mold. Um, as well as uh, clean plastic products presented by RGL. So uh, check us out here in a, in a couple more weeks. Um, before I guess I turn it over here to Dr. Lamonte of Polyplastics, I wanted to cover a couple of items. Uh, first one is we noticed it may work best if you locate the view menu at the top left of your WebEx screen. Um, go ahead there and select full screen. Uh, you see some of the smaller print, some of the more uh, finer details, I guess. So, and then um, as Bennett had mentioned here, we will ask you to hold questions or submit them through the Q&A portal located in the lower right-hand corner of the WebEx screen. And uh, please direct them to the host, to Sodic Plus Tech host there. Uh, we'll let Dr. Lamonte get through his entire presentation that way. Um, and then I can ask these questions of him and give him a chance to fully answer each one. All right. Um, with that, let's turn it over to the man of the hour, Dr. Lamonte. The uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, we're going to try and share the screen now. Uh, that's always a challenge. <laughs> okay. Ah, there we go. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's go up here. There you go. And the sodic. Okay. 
that I'll just take a second to bring up. Might want to go to full full screen. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll do that. Okay. And as soon as I as soon as it comes up. Okay, that's what I'm at there. It's just snuck down at the bottom. All right. Uh, and we're going to take this and put this up in the corner out of the way. Okay, well, I'd like to thank uh, Sodic for uh, hosting this. Uh, presentation and uh, giving me the opportunity to address everyone. Uh, that said, why isn't it coming? Let's try this again. Yeah, it came up. Ah, voila. Okay. Sorry for that delay. Okay. So, uh, what I'd like to talk to you about today is uh, topaz cyclic olefin copolymers and uh, uh, what they are, their uses in healthcare and life sciences. We're going to cover uh, a little bit about what the topaz COCs are. Uh, as a polymer, we'll cover some of their properties, uh, regulatory information uh, as to their current status. Then, we'll, then the sec next, we'll get into some of the applications, why they're used in those applications, where we see this market. Uh, and then finally, we're going to cover the processing, design, some design and some processing information on the topaz, uh, cyclic olefin copolymer. Okay, topaz cyclic olefin copolymer, uh, it's a unique addition to the ethylene copolymer family. And I really want to kind of emphasize that they are unique. This is not a, a polyolefin like you're accustomed to thinking about. Uh, it has the surface characteristics and some of the chemistry of olefins, but it is 100% amorphous. There is no crystallinity in this polymer at all. Uh, it is glass clear and colorless. It has very high purity uh, and very high moisture barrier uh, as in one of the key features of this. It has good chemical resistance and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. And uh, I like to think it's easy to process if you follow the instructions on the box top. If you don't, well, then it's like putting together the kid's toy on Christmas Eve. Uh, it's a high performance resin and we make this resin. We do a bit in the resin design, uh, where we control, uh, the co it's a copolymer. We control the molecular weight. We control the comonomer level and we control what's called the stereochemistry. And that is how the comonomers are arranged in the chain of the polymer. By doing that, we can produce a range of products and you can see there's several listed here. And we wind up with performance, which is quite different than uh, conventional polyolefins. I mentioned the clarity, uh, the uh, uh, moisture barrier, but we also get exceptional temperature resistance uh, the, uh, and it's chemically inert. And in some cases we have uh, quite unusual UV transmission. So we have a unique resin and the, with that, we can achieve some uh, unique properties. Now for the chemically inclined among you, uh, we take conventional ethylene and we react it with cyclopentadiene. Both of these raw materials are readily available from uh, petroleum cracking. And we create this uh, seven membered ring structure uh, that you see here. It's called norbornene. It has a number of uses, and we are, in fact, the largest uh, manufacturer of norbornene in the world. 
uh, we take that chemical and with additional ethylene, we react it in the presence of metallocene ca catalysts and we produce uh, the topaz copolymers. So, uh, as I mentioned, the, the materials are readily available. The metallocene catalysts are very efficient. And what that really means is that there's a low, very low usage in terms of amount of catalyst per pound of polymer produced. We physically quench that catalyst and remove it from the uh, polymer. And that results in a material with exceptional purity, very low resid metallic residues of any kind. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's amorphous. Uh, this material um, is, uh, has a range of properties, uh, which offers a range of glass transition temperatures. And I want to talk about that just a second. This is not polyolefin in the sense of a low density or high density polyethylene. There is no crystal melting point. So the thermal feature which governs all of the properties is the glass transition temperature. And we make materials with glass transitions from 64 up to 178 degrees centigrade. Uh, this material is relatively stiff. Uh, about 250,000 PSI is the lowest modulus up to about 460,000. So these materials have more acrylic, styrenic-like stiffness. Uh, they're very strong with a high tensile strength but they tend to have a low elongation, very low elongation. Most of them are on the order of about 3% ultimate elongation with no yielding. Uh, the density is uh, modest, about 1.01 to 1.02. It, like other polyolefins, it does not take up any water. It does not absorb water uh, and does not normally require drying. Uh, but it has a very low moisture vapor transmission rate, which means it's an excellent barrier to package liquids uh, for long-term storage. And we'll discuss that in a little bit, a little bit further detail. The, uh, the range of glass transitions that I mentioned covers low up to very high. So we can sterilize this material by a variety of techniques uh, from uh, steam, sterilization, ETO, gamma, beta, uh, but not every material can be sterilized by every technique. Uh, the lower TG material certainly could not withstand steam autoclaving. Uh, the chemical resistance, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more, but we resist tends to be polar things, acids, bases, alcohols, etc. cetera. Uh, there are very low extractables in this material. Uh, it has excellent biocompatibility and it's halogen free. It's not a, a, a PVC or a polyvanildine chloride, uh, which tend to be the moist, uh, some of the, the packaging materials that people use for, uh, for drugs. Uh, the chemical resistance you can see for detail. Uh, very resistant to acids, even very strong acids, 65% uh, nitric acid, 40% sulfuric acid. Uh, so we resist those quite well, aqueous solutions and very strong bases. In terms of solvents, uh, any, most of the polar solvents, we have very good resistance to, uh, ethanol, methanol, et cetera. And uh, this profile, is tends to be what is useful in the uh, medical and diagnostic area. Uh, this is a feature which tends to make us really suited for those types of applications. Once you get into aromatic solvents and non-polar organic solvents, uh, we get attacked and in some cases actually dissolved. So, you know, gasoline, heptane, uh, et cetera, we're not gonna be used under the hood of a car. Okay, uh, we are su susceptible to oils. You see here, mineral oil list and fatty chemicals, oleic acid. So uh, the niche, the chemical resistance profile really suits us 
to medical and diagnostic applications. In terms of the light transmission, uh, light, uh, the transmission of this transparency, you can see that over the visible region from about 350 uh, out to uh, 1000 or 950, we have excellent light transmission. Once you get, you can go even extend a little bit out into the very near infrared uh, and still have very good light transmission. Uh, so we can be used in a number of uh, optical applications. Uh, we have a special grade of material called 8007X10, uh, where we have uh, extended the transmission down into the near UV region, 250 to 300 or, or 350 nanometers. And this is an area where in diagnostic applications, uh, people tend to uh, read results of tests, et cetera. And uh, so they're interested in this type of material for that. Uh, some of the applications could be cuvettes and other diagnostic applications, laboratory type applications. Uh, this gives you a listing of the, of the major grades uh, for molding and film applications uh, by the TG. And you see we plot this against the norborneum content. So you can see we extend from about 63, 64 on up to about 170, 180. Uh, and the major grades that are really used in molding for medical and diagnostics are the 8007, uh, the 5013, 6013, 6015, and 6017. We don't, we don't do too much with the 7010 and the 9506. Uh, in the medical area right now. Uh, this slide kind of describes the melt flow of the material versus temperature. And you remember I said that the, the glass transition is the major uh, that governs everything. And typically amorphous materials will tend to process somewhere around 140 or so centigrade above the glass transition temperature. Uh, once, the, once the material goes from an amorphous uh, solid to, a, to a, uh, a liquid at the glass transition temperature, the viscosity is enormous. And you have to go well above that in order to be able to process it reasonably. So for example, you can see here on this curve, which is the 5013, material that has a glass transition temperature whoops that has a glass transition temperature about 130 135 centigrade and so we would be processing that around 270 centigrade and that's about where we would say to recommend why does that keep changing okay. um, similar for the other the other material so the processing area is kind of a diagonal line from the left right hand lower corner kind of going up to the uh, left hand upper corner that's kind of the the way the different materials will process uh, the 5013 is a very high flow material and uh, 8007 is the next one and those are the ones primarily used for microfluidics applications Uh, compositionally, topaz is a very simple material. There are lots of what we call controversial ingredients in the medical and diagnostic area, which we do not use. We do not, they're not in any way used in our process or in our formulations. And that makes us attractive because not much is going to come out of the material, uh, which would contaminate the, uh, the, uh, a drug, for example, that's being stored in the topaz. We have very wide food and medical approval, uh, including US FDA, uh, FCN notices and drug master files and device master file. And we're listed in, in the European uh, registry. Uh, so we have widespread uh, food and medical approval and uh, can be used for almost any application. 
in terms of the biocompatibility, uh, these typically are, are, are referenced to USB class six, which we are standard grades. Most of them do pass and other studies, which would be the ISO 10993 studies on the physiochemical characteristics of material, mitotoxicity and hemolysis, whether or not clots blood or is uh, so speaking, we have excellent biocompatibility, uh, but you do have to uh, check with us for any specific grade that you might be considering using. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about some specific um, uh, applications that uh, we are currently uh, in and, uh, and why they are being used, why Topaz is being used. For medical and drug contact, uh, the main reason that people want to use us is for clarity. Uh, the drug companies and, pharm and, and other companies want to be able to see the product. They do a lot of visual inspection. Uh, and so our clarity helps them to do that. We're impact resistant, uh, which sounds kind of funny because I told you it's a low elongation and stiff material, but we're impact resistant relative to glass. And that's really uh, one of the major competitors that we deal that we compete against because people want to get out of glass syringes, glass vials uh, into something that's not going to uh, shatter. Uh, we're lightweight, heat resistant, et cetera. Okay, uh, so all of these uh, reasons are why we are suitable uh, and desired in the medical and, and drug contact applications. Uh, we're used right now in uh, in containers, uh, various containers, uh, both blow molded and uh, injection molded, uh, syringes, cartridges, drug cartridges, uh, and uh, an area I'm not going to speak about, but the blister packaging for pharmaceuticals. Uh, we do get involved in in that area, so we're going to restrict it to more injection molding. Uh, an area that we are, have had a long history, probably more than more than 20 years, is in pre-filled syringes. Uh, we uh, have been working with a number of companies over uh, a lot of years, um, and that uh, we make uh, some of them. One of them in particular, Shot, you see the name here, it has quite an extensive line of pre-fillable syringes, uh, and the reason that they're really looking at us is the high moisture barrier, uh, the purity and biocompatibility, the resistance to breakage, et cetera. Uh, this is really for long-term drug storage, uh, in some cases uh, a year or two years on the shelf could be, the, could be involved, okay? Uh, so we are uh, useful uh, for this type of an application. And the major grades are 8,007 and 6013 and 6015. Uh, we get involved in drug delivery devices of various types. In this case, uh, we're talking about insulin delivery devices. Uh, we have uh, both of the high purity and inert surface for long-term drug stability. Uh, we have the design flexibility as a plastic going through injection molding that can't be matched by glass. So they can make things and shapes uh, that would be prohibitive on, with glass. Uh, the low moisture and vapor transmission rate and low drug absorption onto the surface means that the dose is uh, consistent over time. Uh, we have very good chemical resistance to the different formulations. Uh, and we are very lightweight. In this case, you see pictures of wearable uh, insulin delivery devices. Uh, and that's a big area that we are uh, that we are in and we expect to grow uh, quite, uh, quite rapidly in the future as more and more people want to get away from uh, uh, poking themselves daily with needles and get into something that's more of a, a, a more easy and a comfortable device. We get involved in certain uh, surgical, they call them surgical instruments, but it's really, uh, in this case, it's a bone cement mixer. 
uh, anyone that has had or, or knows someone that has had a knee or hip replacement, uh, you recognize that the uh, the artificial joint is actually glued in place into the bone uh, with a bone cement. Uh, this device here is a bone cement mixer, which is used in the in the operating room uh, to mix up the chemicals uh, along with some acrylic monomers uh, to prepare the cement for delivery into the uh, into the joint. Uh, where we come in is we have very good resistance to the acrylic monomers. And that allows them to uh, mix the mix the materials uh, in place. The clarity allows people allows the uh, operator to see inside, which is very important to make sure that there are no uh, no dry spots, no areas that are unmixed, which would make the joint weak. Uh, we have a good excellent uh, dimensional stability, uh, which is necessary in a mixer and in a syringe barrel, which you see on the end. Uh, these devices are gamma sterilized prior to use in the operating room. Uh, the grade that's really used in this uh, almost exclusively is the 8007 SO4. Uh, as I mentioned again, uh, the reason is that we can re resist the aggressive bone cement chemistry. Uh, there is another application which is in dental cement. And uh, which are very similar to bone cement. Some there are some dental cements that are kind of mixed in this type of, uh, not in this type of a device, but in some of the uh, dual dual plunger uh, syringe applicators. So there's a number of different uh, applications for this. Okay, so I'd like to switch now into diagnostic and microfluidic applications. Uh, why is COC used? Why is it of value in these type of applications? Uh, number one is a very high flow. The 8007 and uh, and uh, 5013 have a very high flow, and they can reproduce submicron surface features uh, with uh, almost perfect accuracy. They have outstanding optics, uh, and again, the UV transmission, which is uh, really of interest in diagnostic and microfluidic applications. Uh, certain specific chemical resistances uh, come into play in some of them. Uh, we have a very low autofluorescence. Uh, we are, we, the surfaces are olefinic, which means nothing much sticks to them, but they can be surface treated for certain applications if they want to put uh, something on the surface. Uh, for a specific test or whatever. Uh, we have excellent dimensional stability and the heat resistance for, we have high heat resistance grades for PCR and steam autoclave type situations. One of our early was like a tighter plate. And these are kind of like three by five, uh, devices which have wells in them and they people put chemicals in each well that they can run a high number of chemical reactions at one time. Uh, and they're generally used for what we call high throughput screening of uh, chemicals and set reactions, et cetera, for drug discovery and the like. And also used for PCR type tests. Everybody's heard about PCR te testing with the COVID, but there's a whole host of other types of PCR applications that came long before this one. Um, so why is Topaz used? Uh, we have this high transparency in the near UV region. Uh, and I mentioned the specific chemical resistance. Uh, many of these uh, drug discovery tests are done in a solvent called DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide. Uh, Topaz has excellent resistance to that solvent. Uh, we have high flow and can do very good uh, precision molding, uh, especially because uh, maybe you know 15 or 20 years ago these devices were kind of limited to 96 wells in a three by five area. Well, over the years things have changed and the well what they call the well density has been increased. Uh, right now, uh, 356 
wells, 356 wells is, is very common. Uh, 1536 well trays are common, and in some cases, they can go even beyond that. Uh, so the, the well density has gotten higher and higher, which means the, the wells are smaller, the wall thicknesses between the wells are smaller, and the accuracy of where the well is on that plate has to be tighter and tighter. So uh, we offer a very good dimensional stability for that. Uh, the major grades used for uh, uh, micro tighter plates, uh, the 8007 and the 5013. Uh, this is an example of what's called a micro well array, and it's kind of a um, uh, a far out extension of the micro titer plate. Okay, it's used for ultra high throughput screening, DNA sequencing, and biological research, uh, where instead of these wells, you have these tiny little uh, dimples in in this uh, device, and it's basically a uh, microscope slide type of a device. It's about one inch, they about maybe three, three and a half inches long. Uh, and you can see in these, you can see these very fine wells uh, that are that are in the surface. Uh, these wells are about three microns across and about six microns, six and a half micron on center. So there's an incredible number of features that are molded into that surface. Uh, so why they want the topaz is because we have that outstanding replication of the microstructures, uh, the high transparent, the UV transparency, uh, and the low autofluorescence, excuse me, and low birefringence. Uh, and, and these devices uh, are, uh, are quite unusual. If you picked up one of these uh, and you tried to look at it, uh, you would not see Else. You would only see a kind of a rainbow pattern from a diffraction of the light with all these surfaces, uh, but you'd probably have to look at a, a five or 600 magnification before you can actually see the wells distinctly. Uh, one of our customers make the eclectic uh, construction kit, which is basically a tool for researchers to come up with uh, designs for microfluidic devices, which will eventually uh, get to a molded part. So they can try different things, different arrangements, different assortments, et cetera. Uh, they like this because they can make, these are very clear. Uh, they can get good, accurate reproduction. Uh, and uh, the materials are the 8007 and the 5013. So this is kind of like a, a basically an instant a prototype type device that uh, that their customers use to help them in designing what they need for their particular test. Uh, and then they get after that's accomplished, then you get to making the actual devices. Uh, these are some examples uh, of uh, diagnostic slides with channels. You can see in the middle picture where they've uh, intercolored to then flow together and, and through the flowing uh, mix to become uniform coming out the other side. Uh, so these channels are put in, in this particular device, this is a, a demonstration, but can be put into any kind of a, a diagnostic test where you enter multiple liquids and try and get mixing through the flow in the device. Uh, there are a number of resins that are used for this. There's some that are different variations. They're different variations of a similar resin. The 25013s are the same, and, and the three different versions of the 8007 have the same base resin, but slightly different uh, variations. Uh, this is an example of a, a point of care test for uh, A1C for diabetes. Uh, this is used for its very high light transmission to be read in the in the uh, in the tester. Uh, very low um, water vapor transmission. Uh, it's biocompatible, and uh, it's low auto auto fluorescence. Uh, so this material, this device is made out of eight thousand seven. 
and has been around uh, quite a number of years now. Uh, it's been uh, at least five or six years that I'm aware of, and, and maybe more. Okay, so that kind of covers uh, a, a sort of a, a broad spectrum of types of applications that we get into uh, in the medical and uh, in life science and diagnostic and microfluidic applications. What I'd like to talk about now is to give you some uh, information about uh, designing with topaz and, and how to mold it. Uh, not certainly everything, but just a flavor of some of the key points. Okay. I mentioned earlier, topaz is a low shrinkage material. Uh, most of the materials, most of our grades tend to be uh, between about uh, 0.4 to 0.7%. Uh, if you want to think of the other way, it's point, uh, 0.4 to 0.7 mils per inch. Okay. Uh, and that we really suggest that uh, you have a very good draft angle. One degree, probably one to two, between one and two degrees is preferred. But there are some special situations uh, where that's uh, not, not possible or not suitable for the application. And generally, in some cases, we can get as low as a half a degree in special situations. Uh, the failure mode of this material is brittle. It's a low elongation and the failure is brittle. Uh, so you want to make sure that you try and avoid sharp corners. Uh, in the part, uh, anything that might concentrate stress. So we generally recommend a pretty generous uh, uh, radius in the corners. We'd like about half, the, between one half and one full thickness as the internal radius um, of, the, uh, of the corners. Uh, does not like undercuts. Uh, this, these materials, and particularly the high temperature materials, set up very hard, very quickly, and will not like being stretched when you try and pull them over an undercut to get it out of the mold. Uh, generally, what happens is the part cracks, sometimes shatters, uh, so we do not recommend undercuts. There are, and there have been a couple of successful uh, uses of undercuts, but they are very, very shallow and uh, have to be designed in, in just the right way in order to not have a problem. Uh, because it's a low elongation material, we tell you to avoid any high strain assembly. Uh, you know, jamming one part into another is not necessarily a good idea. Uh, so uh, you have to kind of avoid that. Uh, gates are, should be sized to prevent uh, uh, shear heating and uh, premature freeze off. Uh, that's uh, particularly true with 8007. Because if uh, if it it stay if it doesn't if it freezes off too quick you'll get you'll get bad sinks, uh, and you'll try and overcompensate by by packing the material quicker, and that will lead to other problems which we'll talk about. Uh, I mentioned the chemical resistance, uh, the chemical resistance profile earlier. Uh, that means that environmental stress cracking uh, can be an issue. So you want to follow the molding guidelines uh, to minimize any residual stress, particularly the mold temperatures. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, and chemical resistance, while we, we've tested some chemicals, we certainly did not, cannot, cannot test everything. And so you should always uh, test that it's suitable uh, for your application. You have to, you're the ultimate arbiter of whether the chemical of whether the chemical is suitable for use with topaz. And uh, close cooperation between, between us and the designer and the end user is usually uh, the best way to get high quality parts. In terms of molding, uh, I wanted to mention a few things about molding that were important. Uh, first thing is that drying is not normally required. Uh, and I mentioned that uh, because it does not absorb any water, okay? Topaz uh, COC, this family of materials uh, does, however, absorb oxygen from the air. 
And so when you're molding the higher temperature grades, uh, the higher heat TG materials, you may get improved color by drying the resin. Because what happens is the drying actually drives the oxygen out of the pellets and results in uh, less oxygen in the barrel when the pellets are melting and gives you the best color. Uh, the mold temperatures are very important uh, in order to get the best appearance of the part and also to get the best, uh, the, the lowest residual stress in the part. And so every grade that we have has a mold temperature which is appropriate for it. And they vary de depending on the glass transition temperature. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we like to have a good homogenization of the melt without undue shear heating. Uh, so we like, generally speaking, lower compression screws. Uh, uh, definitely do not like rapid transition screws. Uh, we want to avoid overpacking, uh, particularly in the 8007 grades. Uh, and, and I'll show you some more information about that. And we want to, uh, and sometimes uh, if it's a little difficult to release, uh, there's a feature on many molding machines called delay of ejection. Uh, and sometimes uh, adding a second or two uh, of delay of ejection where you open the mold and it sits there for a second or two before the ejector pins are applied. Uh, that sometimes is beneficial to the release of the part. Uh, we talked about the draft before. And finally, uh, a topaz uh, COC has poor miscibility with other materials. Uh, I'm not, not to say that it's going to have a, a bad reaction, but it's just not compatible. And so you'll see um, uh, haze, milkiness in the parts, uh, and this can sometimes happen for a long time uh, while the material transition uh, occurs. Uh, because the topaz, as I mentioned, is lo they're low viscosity materials. So pushing out other materials out of the barrel can sometimes be a diff difficult task. Also, uh, if you're doing air conveying by uh, dust in the line, you know, previous uh, dust from previous materials that are in the lines, they can contaminate the topaz and you wind up having uh, uh, some issues with uh, clarity and appearance. So you need to avoid contamination uh, to get the best uh, optical quality uh, in the parts. Uh, this kind of gives you a breakdown of the molding conditions. And you can see that from each grade, uh, from the 8007 to the 6017, the glass transition goes up and the temperatures go up, processing temperatures go up accordingly. And most most apparently the mold temperatures, the suggested mold temperatures go up accordingly. Okay. Uh, you want to kind of be in the sweet, the sweet spot in the middle of each of these ranges, but then you could adjust it uh, from there. Okay. Now, the, in terms of the rest of the molding conditions, uh, the injection pressures and hold pressures should be kind of moderate. Uh, injection speed a little on the fast and moderate to fast. Uh, it likes a little back pressure and in, for really good optics, we tend to run a much higher back pressure. Uh, I mentioned, uh, let's see, let's look here, screw suck back. We tend not to like screw suck back because it cools off the tip of the resin uh, that's in the nozzle and uh, that material comes in and, it, and its viscosity is different and uh, it gives you a, uh, can give you a splay or a streak of some kind. It's, it's, we tend not to like that. If you've got to use it, if you have to use it for some reason, we want it to be the minimum possible. We also like a small cushion. Uh, I mentioned the lower compression screw. Uh, so uh, that's where we prefer that. Uh, and as I said before, the drying is not normally required. Well, if you don't follow some of the things, the mold temperature in particular, this is what can happen. You want 
you give up, you give up appearance. The haze gets worse. Uh, it varies from grade to grade. In 6015, it's actually pretty severe. If you're molded too cold on the mold, uh, you definitely see an increase in the haze. If you're getting too hot, it begins to adhere to the surface, uh, and it, you get kind of a peeling. So you get a little a, a poor appearance because of the peeling. So there is a sweet spot. Uh, you want to kind of stay around that sweet spot in order to uh, get the best possible part. Uh, these are the shrinkage, some information on shrinkage. As the temperature goes up for the 8007, the shrinkage increases uh, a little bit, but you can see that it's see, to start with 0 0.2 to 0 0.2 to 0.3 percent, uh, 0.3 to 0.4. Uh, for the uh, transverse and the flow directions. The 6015 uh, is a little bit more temperature sensitive, but the overall level is higher. And unusually, the 6015, the 6017 rather, is actually pretty temperature independent uh, in terms of the shrinkage, but it's up higher in the 0.6 to 0.7 area. I, the effect of pressure, though, is quite different. Uh, there is obviously a, the more pressure you apply, the more injection pressure, cavity pressure, uh, you tend to get less shrinkage. What is significant is the 8007, where the shrinkage drops by more than half, can dropping almost towards zero, depending on uh, how much pressure you apply. That is what the source of the overpacking. If you try and inject it, uh, apply too much pressure. You wind up packing it in the part and it becomes really difficult to eject. So, as I mentioned, with 8007, you need to be uh, more cautious about injecting, injection pressure. Uh, of course, I need to put up uh, this slide, which tells you to disregard everything I told you before and I wasn't here today. Uh, and I would like to thank SODIC for hosting this seminar. I'm Ronald Lamonti. Uh, who do market development and technical support, and that's my contact information. And Barbara Canali is our strategic account manager uh, for Topaz COC. So with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Dr. Lamonte, uh, thank you for the, the wonderful presentation, very in-depth there. Um, we did get a number of questions in here, so let's just start off, all right? Uh, First question, you mentioned that COCs have high moisture barrier. Does right. it also have low moisture vapor transmission rate? Well, that's, that's the, the, when it's a high barrier, it is a low transmission rate. That's what it, that's what it means. Excellent. Um, with, with the polymerization on, uh, with the meta, metallocene catalyst, Right. Is there a risk of residual unsaturation in the final COC polymer pellets? Uh, no, uh, we have we have done a checking over a uh, long time, <clears throat> and uh, it, there is a very very little residual unsaturation. This is an an addition polymerization, uh, and so the unsaturation is very very low. Excellent. Um, for recommendations on a purge compound, what would you recommend? Okay, um, over the years I've tried, uh, I've used successfully a material called Acetlene E, it's A-S-A-C-L-E-A-N, E is an Edward. Uh, you can follow that up uh, with uh, either the topaz or a low density polyethylene and then the topaz, and that'll scrub it out very good. Uh, one of my colleagues has had good success with a material called Ultra Purge. Uh, and uh, I think it was 50, 55, 10 was the grade, but I, I would have to check that. Great, thank you. Uh, next question here, can anti-reflective coatings be applied to COC? And if so, are there any limitations in examples of that? 
Um, you can put you can put AR coatings on topaz. It's very easy to metallize uh, the topaz. Um, examples. Um, well, uh, for for a while we were used in a, a number of uh, lens applications that uh, required AR coatings, but I don't have a specific example now that I could give you. But they are they are applied uh, to can be applied to topaz and would not be a problem. Absolutely. Uh, the specific difference between COC and COP. Okay, so both uh, of them often come up right as a glass replacement polymer. Right. Uh, we are the COC is what we call an addition polymer. In other words, we that the chemistry is that it adds a an ethylene, then a norbornene, and an ethylene, and a norbornene, or maybe ethylene, ethylene, norbornene, it, they're added, okay? The COP is actually made from the norbornene, the same, the same thing, but they do it what they call a ring opening polymerization, where they take that ring, the, the uh, I'm gonna go back, let's see if I can do this going back here, hold on. We're getting there. One more. Can I? Okay. This um, this here structure in this ring that's broken open, and it and now has a double bond, and it's added that way. The COP is made so that there is a double bond in every in every uh, other molecule and then it has to be hydrogenated structurally if you look at the topaz we're hanging the ring is hanging off the side of the chain in the cop the ring is is integral to the chain if you follow what i'm saying um so there are some structural differences the catalyst is different. The chemistry is different. Uh, they are technically in the same family, the cyclic olefin copolymers, cyclic olefin polymers, rather. Uh, but structurally, they're different, and chemically, they're different. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, I believe that, that answers it great. Thank you. Um, next question is, what are the observable symptoms of too much shear in the process? Uh, you wind up you wind up overheating the polymer, uh, and it can tend to yellow. Right. That would be, How, that would be the major thing you'd see. Right. So, kind of here's a question that relates back to the COC versus COP. Um, mm -hmm. Examples of when one would be better than the other. Uh, uh, COC is always better. Okay. <laughs> uh, next question: Why is the back pressure recommended setting very low? Right, fifty psi compared to polycarbonate at five hundred to a thousand psi. Uh, we tend we find that we tend not to need it. The lower viscosity, I don't know, maybe the gas gets out better. Uh, but that's that's been our recommendation. We have have had. Okay. Um, what uh, is the recyclability? Uh, recyclability or regrind? I'm not. Uh, re recyclability is a word that they're using. Okay. Well, recycle, uh, to me, tends to imply like in the recycle stream with other polyolefin, polyethylene bottles, etc. And yeah, topaz can be recycled with polyethylenes. Uh, it's a minor component and it would just be blend in with the polyethylene. Regrind is a little bit different than that. Okay, and regrind, topaz can be reground. We've done um, 
uh, multiple regrinds, 100% regrinds, et cetera, uh, with no change in properties, no significant change. Uh, we would probably recommend, uh, if push come to shove, about maybe uh, 15 to 20, 15% regrind would be a good number to use. 15% regrind. Uh, but typically, in these medical and diagnostic applications, they don't use regrind. They use virgin material. Right, right. So, uh, what are the typical bonding methods for topaz? You can ultras topaz can be ultrasonically welded. It can be uh, heat heat bonded. It can be laser welded. It can be laser welded to itself actually with some of the newer uh, clear to clear laser welding technology. Uh, can be it can be adhesively bonded. Uh, you may have to do a surface treatment because it has the surface energy of like a polypropylene. So not much sticks to it really. So to get really good adhesion with uh, adhesives, uh, you'd probably have to do a, a corona or plasma treatment before you do the adhesive. Excellent. On uh, but the COC. Can that be used as a barrier material in multi-layer um, situations? Yes, it is actually today. Uh, we do. I, I didn't discuss films, but uh, in in multi-layer films, topaz is uh, used as the water barrier. I did show uh, I did show a um, uh, a blister pack that typically is. Uh, uh, I remember years ago when I started working on those, it was polypropylene, topaz, polypropylene. And the polypropylene was gave you the, the, uh, basically the toughness and the topaz was the barrier layer. So those kind of things are, are, it's been, it's been used quite extensively over the years. Wonderful. So. In, in two shot molding applications, how does topaz work? Well, that's a, that's a toughie because it is an olefin, right? And polyethylene or polypropylene doesn't stick to much. So when you go to have a two shot molding, uh, if it's like just an AB layer, uh, there really is not any adhesion between the topaz and say uh, PET, polycarbonate, nylon, uh, uh, of getting uh, a delamination. Uh, topaz with polyolefins, polyolefins in particular, uh, the adhesion is excellent. So you could do something like a, a, a polyolefin or a, 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 what do they call the ultra low polyethylenes, ultra low density polyethylenes, which are very soft. Uh, as a as an overlayer to put a soft hard thing, that would work. Uh, you could use a you could I hate to bring it up. You could use a TPE with topaz, but you remember the chemical resistance chart about mineral oil. We are attacked by mineral oil, so you'd have to find a TPE that does not have mineral oil, and that would work fine. And then of course, to, actually, we have an elastomer. Topaz makes its own elastomer. Which that would work. Now, is N2 blanketing required during molding? Uh, required, no. Can it be helpful? Yes. But I wouldn't say it's required. We'll uh, kind of stick to that uh, topic here. Will general purpose screws work for the topaz resin? Yes, they will. We have many, many customers using general purpose screws, but uh, given our druthers, we would suggest a lower compression, something like a 2.2 to 2.5. Uh, those are typically used in like polycarbonates and acrylics, amorphous materials that like, like a little lower compression. Sure. Excellent. Now, um, with, with lower pack pressures and larger gates, how long is a typical gate seal? with this material um, in seconds with a larger gate? And is there issues with voids or bubbles 
impacting clarity? Uh, I'm going to have to plead ignorance on the gate seal time. I really don't know. Um, any bubbles, uh, the, the part of the reason to try and get the gates larger is to be able to keep it open because as the shrinkage comes, you want to be able to fill it, but you don't want to, you don't want to overpack it while you're trying to fill it. Um, if you got bubbles, there's something else, something else going on. It's, I wouldn't, um, something else, the gate's not doing that. All right. So, um, and maybe that answers this part of the question as well, but what process technique would you use to remove voids in the material? Um, say that the thicker areas couldn't be avoided by design. Well, typically I would, I would you want to inject in the thickest areas, right? That's the normal thing. If you can't, then you've got to somehow uh, inject uh, faster to try and get it to fill, I think. Uh, but not, but get it, get the material over there. The part of the issue is the thin section is going to cool it off before it gets to the thick section. Um, I would try increasing the temperature and maybe injecting it faster. Okay. Uh, following that up here as well is how to process out grainy texture on the surface of optical molded components of topaz. That's uh, that's that's the mold temperature. The mold temperature is too cold. And is uh, is mold simulation effective for the topaz material? Uh, we supply many customers with mold flow data, and they do their analyses, and we've never heard complaints. So I'm assuming it's effective. Um, last question I have here for you. Uh, where is the Topaz COC manufactured, and where are polyplastics uh, technical centers located? Well, currently, Topaz is manufactured in uh, Germany, uh, in Oberhausen, Germany, and is supplied worldwide uh, uh, to uh, the Far East and the uh, United States and every and South America, etc. Uh, we have some technical. Uh, resources here in, in Michigan. Uh, we have a small technical laboratory here. There's one at the, at the manufacturing site in uh, Germany, and we have the parent company uh, has a extensive uh, technical resources in Japan. Wonderful. So we did get one last question snuck in here. So uh, <laughs> what future applications will Topaz lead the market in? Well, as as we see it, uh, we expect that there's going to be uh, continued, very rapid growth in uh, pre-filled syringes. Uh, as people want to get uh, uh, simple and quick in one-shot doses around the world, uh, I think that that's going to be a, a big area. And I think uh, the microfluidic, the uh, point of care, and uh, at home testing will probably uh, continue to grow and and that will be a bigger area for topaz in the future great stuff today ron i really appreciate the time um len i i'm not sure if you wanted to say a few words here as well but thank you everyone that joined us and, and stayed for the presentation ron thanks for the the great presentation and answering all those questions okay yeah, thank, thank thank you, uh, uh, Barb and uh, Dr. Lamani. Always appreciate uh, your partnership and working together over the years. Um, looking forward to see you sometime soon. It's been a while, but uh, um, we're all getting out and about. We just finished a couple of trade shows. The LSR 2021 and the Molding 2021 was real good. We're we're bringing machines out to different regional shows. We'll keep everybody up to date with that and. Um, Hey, thanks so much. It was a great group. Thanks for everybody joining and have a, a wonderful afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for Thank your you. attention. Bye bye. Bye now. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm.